<laughs> these these four people stand between you and a free drink. But we've we we've, yeah. we've got a lot to uh, cram into an hour though, because we, we do have an hour, don't we, till five forty five. Uh, Nathan on the end there needs no introduction because we've just spent an hour with him. Uh, Kate Hines, crack commercial lawyer, uh, with some cli amazing clients actually. I'd love to know what you did with them. But <laughs> clients like, uh, well, Hoodlum and PRA here, and Halfbrick, uh, Google, uh, News Corp. There's some fantastic clients in there, so uh, interested to hear more about that. Help getting them out of trouble. Yeah. Get them into trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Julie Eckersley from Matchbox. So uh, Julie's a, a, as a producer there at Matchbox. She's um, well Matchbox, of course, uh, um, have made shows like The Slap and pro arguably, you know, one of the biggest production companies in Australia. I'm sure you've all heard of them. But produce, uh, Julie herself is responsible for um, Maximum Choppage, which is a six by half hour comedy series with ABC coming up, starring Lawrence Lung. Australia's and she first kung fu comedy. And it was, and, and she was also the driving force behind the very innovative uh, multi-platform strategy for Nowhere Boys that we're going to hear about. And Sam White, Sam, I guess for me, always has two hats on now because I always knew him as an animation producer. And I guess your high point was, well, for me, in my <laughs> mind, it was the oh, thanks, yeah. being on the Oscar shortlist. Yeah, that was pretty much as good as it has been. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> but now, uh, I guess over the past so three or four years, I've really uh, moved into games. Yeah. Um, and uh, they have a, si a six-foot kid. They have um, Band Stars, which is doing really well on iOS. And, uh, and more to come. Mm. Uh, and me, I think you know. I don't need an introduction. So I might just set up what we're going to be talking about through this session. Uh, this is about... Um, so you guys have got your great ideas for your stories and your characters. And you're developing them probably just for your primary platform, or as Lee called what I, I liked, uh, his term, the mothership. Um, so maybe you're just you're developing your TV series, or there might be a movie. And this session is really looking at when is when is it right to also be looking at taking those stories or characters onto other platforms in other formats. Uh, it might be a game, or it might be a, a, a web series, or an interactive project of some kind. Or in, in fact, this is quite a broad panel, and it might also be that your mothership is a game. And what might the multi-platform extension be for that game? Um, I figure some of the panelists might disagree with me, but I, th I felt there was... Do you mind just sticking my first slide up? I reckon that uh, when people come to me at Screen Australia looking at uh, financing this type of project, they usually have one of five reasons for doing it, um, although these do tend to blur a little bit. Is that me? Well, there's my name. What's inside that? It's only text that I can... Oh, there it is. <laughs> Let me have a look at it. So you correct me if I'm wrong, but I reckon there's five reasons. One is as a marketing tool. Uh, so uh, the, the Mothership's a TV show, and the interactive stuff they're doing around it is to draw your awareness to the, to the TV show. Um, I mean, this is very challenging in itself because often if this kind of innovative marketing campaign needs its own marketing campaign. Uh, you might be doing it for commercial gain because uh, your IP might have a value and awareness that, that it might be possible to actually make some money from other kind of exploitation of ancillary product. Maybe, maybe you can make a game and sell it for 99 cents and, and actually make a book. Uh, increase the value of the show. And by this I mean uh, take your what might be a casual fan of your TV series and turn them into a deeper more engaged super fan through giving them additional content online in different forms that makes them feel a part of something much bigger. Uh, cultural, this might be the wrong term, but I guess what I mean here is doing something that is, uh, uh, I guess it's an innovative way of extending the story, um, kind of pushing the envelope of this form of entertainment and you're doing it for its own sake because it's the right way to tell the story and because it's something that creatively is worth doing. I don't know if cultural is the right term for that. And finally, um, to, to raise finance, which is just one I added last night, thinking about it, because uh, it might be uh, that your game or multi-platform extension or, or web series or whatever might be much cheaper to achieve than your mothership TV show or movie. And it, it might be that you do that first in order to build a brand and build an audience and convince whoever, whatever marketplace entities you need money from 
that, uh, the, that the show has legs. Um, and then, so let's say you've decided, could you just stick the next? Oh, I didn't say GIMP. I was just calling it GIMP because uh, games, interactive, multi-platform. <laughs> I just figured that was easier than saying them <laughs> over again, so go with me. You've decided that you do want to do something, and then there's four basic questions you're going to ask. Who's going to design and make it? It might be outside of your skill set. How much is it going to cost, and who's going to pay? And then uh, who's going to market it? Because going back to uh, what I said before, build it and they will come is uh, the opposite is true of the internet. Um, so going on from there, we'll, we're going to have a, some, uh, a couple of case studies from each of the <coughs> panelists, and then some time for, for questions afterwards. Um, so we're going to kick off with Nathan. Um, I'm just going to hit, say, play the tape on these because they're sort of, uh, we built, we create these videos specifically for this reason um, to show to clients. So there is a slide step-by-step -step and there's also a strange call step-by-step which actually just will go through in, det in some detail, not too much boring detail, around what exactly we did for those two projects. So maybe slide first. And that would actually be my time then. A lot of time. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. Is that something we can fix? We'll pause it. We should, we should probably pause it and fix it because it's, it's quite a long time. Well, it, no? otherwise, <laughs> I'll, well, I'll just do, I'll do a, a silent movie thing. If you turn the, the um, sound down completely, I can point to different elements in the uh, thing and maybe an interpretive dance. <laughs> <laughs> um, We might be able to skip some you elements. Want me to go? Do you want me to go first? What's that? I think so. You, you guys don't have audio. No, yeah, I've got audio. I don't. Yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. lo-fi. I've got enough. Do that. <laughs> Except they probably, need, they, they probably need the laptop in order to fix the audio. Mm. Just uh, talk amongst yourselves. Let's stick the lights down again. Welcome to the world of Slide, a revolutionary new Australian multi platform drama where five teenagers discover. There's a first time for everything. Set against the vibrant music scene of Brisbane's Fortitude Valley, 
Luke, Tammy, Ed, Eva and Scarlett fall headlong into a summer of unpredictable adventures over a 19 week experience. Each character embodied the interests and passions of our audience and took the story to where they lived. Music, art, fashion, games, and friendship. From the outset, the writer's room was charged with telling the stories across every platform Slide lived on. Slide was conceived as a project that would capture the essence of everything about being 17, introducing a new approach that responded to a demanding audience on their own terms and in their own time. For this group, entertainment means much more than just TV. Existing online, on mobile devices, across social networks, and in the real world. Forming a wider community that discussed and interacted with the show. Storytelling is no longer a one-way street, and the integration of fans now takes a leading role. Like its audience, Slide lives and breathes multi-platform, giving fans more of the story, more of the characters, and more of the show they love. Slide invited the audience into the story, rewarding the fans for their time and encouraging them to accept the Slide characters as part of their inner circle. I really believe in best friends. Well, they still believe in you. Slide began with a rich eight-week prequel to introduce the audience to its intriguing characters. Via a rich media home site, exclusive webisodes, an online graphic novel, an iPhone app, and a massive social media strategy, fans got to know Hunky Luke, Lovable Ed, the enigmatic Eva, Scarlet the Seductress, and Brainiac Tammy. Slide stepped into the real world, with fans able to follow the characters in story updates via Twitter, as well as regular conversations between the characters, who also interacted with real Twitter users. Tammy wrote weekly reviews of emerging Brisbane bands for a local music magazine. Scarlet's fashion tumbler sampled real-world fashionistas and inspired a host of fan sites, while Eva's art appeared all across Brisbane. A highly active Facebook fan page kept fans up to date with everything slide, building a thriving community around the upcoming series, but importantly, it also became a place for fans to share their own stories and adventures. Thousands of users contributed and debated their favourite moments and expectations, weeks before the on-air show even began. And more than just telling the slide story, this dual screen experience used Facebook to become a portal to cool content from across the web, including links to gigs, events, and news stories. More a way of life than simply a TV show. When slide premiered on Fox 8, it set new records for teen drama for Australian cable TV. On air, slide was a 10 week season, following our characters as they fly through their final weeks of school and smash their way into adulthood. But it didn't stop there. This was a daily experience with new content released constantly. Fans were offered exclusive scenes that bridged the story before and after each TV episode. The before bits set up storylines that would be paid off on air. And then after each TV episode aired, audiences could watch the after bits which set up the stories that would play out online. Using story to compel fans to engage with all platforms in the world of Slide. Each webisode was followed by a series of irreverent questions for the community to comment on and share, creating a culture of participation with thousands of contributions every week. This level of engagement embraced the fans as active participants and allowed the producers to tailor the content as the experience rolled out, the audience informing the story as it was being told. Every episode of Slide also inspired addictive games based on key storylines, be it the infamous couch throw from Ed's birthday, the festy pool in episode 2, Tammy and Luke's date from hell, or the trolley surfing from week 8, fans were able to literally play the story in a way that was fun, funny, and instantly shareable on Facebook. The story of Slide was also extended each week in an interactive graphic novel created by the enigmatic artist Eva. She shared her own warped take on her new friends in a series of illustrated stories that fans could interact with. Fans were encouraged to contribute to discussion threads within each story as it unfolded. Eva's distinctive artwork made regular appearances throughout each TV episode of Slide in the most unlikely places, as well as in the real world with local artists creating street art based on the themes of Slide. Fans could also get a peek behind the curtain via weekly behind the scenes mini documentaries highlighting the use of music, art, and multi-platform as characters in the world of Slide. 
Brisbane's legendary music scene provided the pumping soundtrack for Sly with emerging local and Australian bands appearing throughout episodes, as well as in Tammy's gig reviews online and on custom playlists on the home site. Sly was about watch, play and share, building a community and rewarding it. It all peaked with an exclusive live screening of the final episode in Brisbane, with hundreds of the show's online fans jostling for the opportunity to finally meet each other in person, along with the cast and producers of the show. Then, after the mother of all story bombs to end episode 10, fans at the screening began tweeting the news. They were soon joined by the wider fan community, resulting in Slide trending on Twitter nationally in Australia. Slide extended its story across multiple platforms to incorporate the audience in ways that were both pioneering and enriching. Every user journey was unique. Fans could choose how they wanted to participate and on what platform, be it through social networks, games, mobile, graphic novels, webisodes, or simply TV. Hoodlum, Playmaker Media, Foxtel, and the Fox 8 channel embraced the realities of storytelling in the digital age, a world where life is multi-platform, and so are our stories. So maybe just go straight ahead onto the next one and get them. Welcome to Coolum. Come up to the ocean. Come to the Coolum sunrise. Come down. Things can get pretty strange around here at night. Luckily, there are two fearless heroes here to investigate. Meet Banks. I'm the new night policeman! And his eccentric offsider. Greg is the name, I'm the uh, uh, night security for the town. Together, Banks and Gregor answer the strange calls. Beach Police, this is Officer Banks speaking. The creators of The Strange Calls, this was always going to be a multi-platform experience. The world of Gregor and Banks was just too strange, too weird and too much fun to be contained by TV. Every department, from writing, through camera, design, scheduling and all the way through to marketing, embraced this revolutionary approach to storytelling and production, allowing it to reach out to fans and grow an active, vibrant community. So this is the first vlog for my new $15,000 website. It all started with a series of web videos posted by an eccentric old man from Coolum. These videos pointed people to Gregor's website, which featured some of the strange stories he'd collected from around town. Over a pre-season campaign across Twitter, Facebook and the Strange Calls website, fans discovered the unhinged world of Gregor. But at that point, Gregor was just a crazy conspiracy theorist in a caravan. A Batman without a Robin. Until Banks showed up. This is my office. And you'll be living here too. What if I have to arrest someone? <laughs> in Coolum, at night, everyone's asleep. Each week, this very undynamic duo investigated a weird, seemingly supernatural event around the sleepy beachside town of Coolum. Uh, I'm becoming a tree! Wow. Ugh. Gregor! But they never quite saw things the same way. He's a criminal, Gregor. He's a chicken! Throughout the investigations, Gregor would document everything he saw and share it with his fans. Gregor! They like you, Banks. My Twitter followers. The results would appear in real time as their latest adventure went to air. Fans could follow up the investigations on Gregor's website where he would post a weekly vlog detailing his latest theories about the case. Oh, I've had a hit on my map. He said he's seen the horse in the sewer again. Thanks. Have you ever roped a steer? What? I swear to you, it's there. You heard the clip clop. I just spent seven hours lost in a stormwater drain looking for a sewer horse. Actually, it's a quarter pound. And you can check out some of the news articles about the sewer court pony on my site. Gregor also kept meticulous case files that fans could explore to find hard evidence surrounding the latest mystery. And the odd limerick. Gregor also invited fans to contribute their own stories of the supernatural on an interactive map. I was abducted and probed by an alien. 
or record their very own strange Hello? call on his answering machine. Please help! My son was just sucked into our game of mousetrap. The community responded enthusiastically and pretty soon Gregor's interactive map and the message machine were overflowing. But Gregor wasn't just your average paranormal nut bar. I hope you like chess. What? Have our hero quest. He had other interests too and shared his reviews of 90s TV shows, a restaurant guide to cool them and tips on how to win at board games. And despite being really old, I'm 47. Yes, you're 47, I know. Gregor was also an avid tweeter who wasn't afraid to share his inner musings about life, love and chicken nuggets. Oh, you have a Twitter. Could you just turn that onto silent? And if anyone had any questions, Gregor would be there with answers. My stolen blossom tapes are already trending on Twitter. <laughs> Over six weeks, fans watched across TV, Twitter, Facebook and the Strange Calls site as Banks and Gregor solved weirder and weirder mysteries. What's the matter? Scared? Yes. And somewhere amongst all the mayhem, across parallel dimensions and multiple platforms, Banks and Gregor became friends. I'd like that very much, Banks. And made a whole lot of friends along the way. We're just setting up for Julie next. Yep. I might just ask you. So that's um, the Nowhere Boys. And Nathan, just out of those, I, I was just wondering, um, across those two campaigns, can you remember, was there anything in particular that worked maybe better than you thought it would? And, uh, but conversely, anything that you thought was going to work that, that didn't find it, that didn't connect quite so well? Uh, um, yes, I think we, uh, you know, I think there were elements like the graphic novel was uh really well received but actually took up a lot of resource to do it um but that's not to say i wouldn't do it again um and then i think there was a, a few sort of technology things on um strange calls but look the broad answer on that is i think you're just ex you're still experimenting and um you ha you create that stuff and i i, I still think like I've, i mean i've got the stats on how we don't uh, how we got the conversion rates on that uh, on those two projects, but um, there's always going to be stuff that you actually really believe in that's not going to do as well, and then there's always going to be the surprises. But I think at the end of the day, it works because it's an extension of the world. You know, it doesn't feel none of that feels like it is a an afterthought. Um, and I think again, it comes to what Lee said earlier, which is it all. All of that material, even the even the text-based content that we did, ca comes out of the writers' room, you know, and the way that sort of Gregor thought about that stuff. So yeah, you, you can certainly tell across both of those campaigns that it was something that was conceived at the same time as the idea for the show itself, yeah. and that really pays off, obviously. Did you want to set up what your? Uh, yeah, sure. I might stand up. Yeah, you can. Do you want to? Hello, um, so as the slide says, as Mike introduced, I'm Julie, I'm a producer at Matchbox Pictures. Um, so I'm just going to talk you through our project that we did um, with our big um, kids show that we did um, last year called Nowhere Boys. Um, and we decided to do an online element for that. So I guess as opposed to um, Hoodlum, we're more a traditional producer of content. Um, and this was a project we do always we're increasingly looking at how we can extend online. And we know that's, you know, as, as um, has been pointed out today, that that's a lot of where the market's looking. But this is more how we approached it, why we chose it for this project, what we did and how we went about it. Um, right. So... Um, the TV show is called Nowhere Boys and the um, online element that we added was Nowhere Boys, the fifth boy. There were four central boys in the show and for the online element we added a fifth character that, um, that those who engaged with it had the chance to, to become. Uh, did anyone see or know of Nowhere Boys? Do you have an idea? It's a 30, just really briefly, it's a 13-part kid series made for ABC3. 
Um, Simon Hopkinson uh, sent out the brief that he wanted a, a show that was really aimed at teenage boys um, or boys sort of age 8 to 12. Um, and Tony Ayres responded to that brief with the idea of, um, of four boys who go on a school excursion um, and get lost overnight, so a bit of a sort of a traditional setup. Um, but when they come back the next day to the town that, that they've lived in their whole lives, no one in that town knows who they are and they've got to work out who, what happened. Um, so just sort of practically speaking, what, what we created um, was an interactive game, an interactive game that was is really immersive. Um, uh, the players entered through the broadcaster's online site to discover a fifth boy. They're lost in the world and they have to solve it as well. Um, so what we did in terms of setting that up was um, a week before the episode went to air, there was a, a countdown that appeared on the ABC3 website and we worked really closely with ABC3 on this project. And that countdown ran out 10 minutes before the first episode aired. So um, people knew that, and, and, the, and the, the image that was on the screen was just the boy, our central boy, the fifth boy, sleeping. Um, so you had a sense of, of being drawn into that project to, to set it up. Um, it was a third person, it, it is a third person 3D adventure game. It's parkour style movement, um, spatial puzzle solving, light combat, and a really strong narrative. Um, and as I said, it's hosted on the ABC3 web, uh, website and it's, it's totally free. So one of the things that was really important to us in terms of um, choosing to do this project with, with Nowhere Boys um, was that we really wanted the, the story worlds to intertwine. Um, and that was foundational, that was set up right from very early on and that was something that we had kept coming back to and carried all the way through. Um, we, we wanted the, the two platforms to speak to each other and the framework that we ended up using to do that um, was uh, was a rollout where we had um, six, six game worlds that unlocked at different points and 13 episodes. So, um, as I said, there was the setup um, of the boy sleeping, the first episode played, then the boy woke up 10 minutes before that episode um, had finished. You then had t the time of two episodes, which was two weeks, um, in how the ABC rolled it out, to play through the first game world. When you got to the end of that game world, you'd go back to a countdown again till whatever point, however far away the, the, the next episode was. Then you'd have another, about two episodes to play through again, another game world would unlock um, and, and, and so on. And the reason that we uh, framed it like that was because of how the platforms talk to each other. So things that you did in the game world would impact and set up things that you'd then see in the episodes. Um, and, um, and so, for example, um, you'd get, uh, in the first game world, you get to unlock um, a, a shed. And then when you watch the next episode of the show, um, the boys arrive um, at that shed and they sort of comment that the door's open. Again, if you, just, if you just were watching the TV show, you wouldn't even notice it, you'd go right over you. But if you've played the game, you've been there, you've unlocked the door, we really wanted to give people that experience that they were impacting things. Um, another time you get to put flour in a cupboard that then sort of saves the boys from, from, what, from a, you know, a nearly being caught. And, um, so that was why the, the rollout was really important um, in terms of how we addressed it. And um, we also had, um, in the game world, I'll show you a clip in a second, there's like, we would tear through the game world with video footage at quite a few different places. And you'd see either um, events that were about to happen or events that had just happened, and you'd put them in the context of your playing world. Um, so all the time we were just really trying to get the two platforms, the two story worlds, um, to talk to each other and really give the player the experience that they were influencing the TV show. That was really at the heart of what we wanted to achieve. Um, this is a clip. So I'll just before you play this clip, I'll just say this clip was particularly designed. It's only a one minute long clip, but what um, what we were trying to show in this is is the two platforms talking to each other. So it's got bits of the bits of the game in it and bits of um, a bits of the TV show, picking out some of the key parts where they cross over. And one of the things that we did in episode thirteen. Um, when, when the, so after episode 12 you, you've kind of completed, that's ideally when you've completed um, the game world. And then in episode 13 your, your game character has gone home, but he actually then appears in episode 13. So at the end of this clip you see the game character come to life in episode 13 of the TV show as a payoff. Oh, sorry, the clips, yeah. Bro, 
brought a GPS. Nothing. We're officially nowhere. Hello? It's open. I can get through these things. I I'm sure of it. Whoa! What the? That's the lamp I just had. If tears are windows to another world, then I should be able to get home through them, right? I think there might be forces at play which we don't understand. Please help me! But I'll find an answer. It's those boys again. Maybe they're lost, like me. That spiral, it's the same as the one on the page. I'm connected to them. You guys need this more than me. Hope this helps. Whatever's going on happened to all of us. There's someone here! You have disturbed the order. Order must be restored. In terms of who made it, um, obviously we're not, we, are, we don't make games, so we needed to find a partner for this. Um, the IP, the idea was ours, um, and then we worked really closely with ABC3 um, and, and Harry, um, Harry uh, Ravenswood there, who was amazing, um, and also and Millipede did the build for us, and they were fantastic as well. Um, so how we, how we actually got there... Um, we were really lucky. We, we went through a something that Mike set up, I don't think exists anymore, called the Digital Ignition Fund. It's an amazing initiative and it was so helpful. And I'm just telling you about it, not to make it excruciating that it's not there, but because right at the beginning when we were still developing the TV show, um, we were lucky enough to be picked by Mike, one of seven projects around Australia, to spend a week. Um, it was me and one of the writers and we basically had a week with people who were doing the best, most exciting stuff in this all around the globe that Mike brought together to develop this and that really set the foundation for the idea that, that, and, and set the vision that we never really swayed from. It was really amazing. In terms of how we raised the money, it was part of the main budget um, and that was an ongoing conversation with Screen Australia as to how we how we do that. Um, and Screen Australia put in actual additional money into our main budget and also ABC put in additional money to our main budget. So it was run through as part of the main budget but it was sort of a separate line item um, with its own key things within it. Um, in terms of production then, we also, we were, um, we were collecting assets all the way through. So the timeline of the game was very much um, tied up with production. We needed to make sure we collected assets all the way through so that that was all working together, which is um, a logistical feat, I'm sure you can attest to, Nathan. Why do we do it? Why this project? Um, well, I mean, for Matchbox, for us, it always comes back to story. That is always the focus of the company. How do we create the best story we can? But then on top of that, how do we, how do we really add value? How do we maximise value? And we, um, we felt that this was a project that on both of those fronts we could really add value to the project because of the audience, which was boys age 8 to 12, and we knew that they wanted to be online and, and, and playing games. Um, we felt that we could really deepen their engagement with, their pro with, the, with the project and their loyalty to it, which is really important, again, adds value. Um, we knew we could expand the story world. We're a little bit in sci-fi world, so that felt like a really good fit. Um, and just generally adding value for international sales and things like that, which we've also been able to do. The lessons that we learned um, start early, and you've heard Nathan say that as well, like really this stuff works best when it's really right from the beginning um, and, and not a later thought. I just, I can really, can't sort of stress that enough. Story guide, I say that um, at Matchbox on all of our projects we have a role called the showrunner. And the showrunners, I always say that they're the rock stars of the company because they're essentially, they often get a producer or an EP credit. Um, Tony Ayres, who was the showrunner on Nowhere Boys, um, is one of our, our main people who do that. It's a very specific, very important role and basically they hold the creative vision of the show. So they don't have to, so they're not so worried about budgets and all that part of producing. They really just focus on story and it makes an enormous difference. And in terms of making sure that our online and game world was talking to the main 
TV show because both of those projects were being developed and intertwined and one would happen and, you know, influence the other. We had someone specifically, Craig Irvin, who was holding that vision for us. And I think that really played a big part in the project having story integrity because if something had happened on in the online world that hadn't matched up you know, in a sci-fi kind of way, it just would have undermined everything in the world. So it was a really important role. Um, the right partners, we talked to different people. We, before we settled on Millipede, we went through a process and looked at different people to find the right fit, the person who could deliver what we wanted at the budget, people that we knew we could work that closely with was really important, so be vigilant about that if that's not your skill base. Um, again, knowing the audience. Um, we, we had, we had talked to lots of people, we had some big other ideas, but we decided really just to focus on this one thing, an online game. Um, and, and that, I think, w that was what we could do in the project. And doing one thing well was better than doing a lot of things half-heartedly. Um, scope and timelines, I've produced animation and TV, and I find games from a, a, a more TV perspective is much more like an animation. It's much more, um, much more almost, well, you guys are, who know the game world, you probably know this, but it's a lot more, um, there's no turning back. There's points where there's no turning back, where you can kind of be re-editing and re-editing in TV. The build is, is really different, so just being, uh, being aware of that. Um, also, we just, because it's such a fast-moving world, when we started it, we didn't um, anticipate how big iPad was going to be by the time we'd finished it, you know, almost a year later. So we actually had to go back and find additional money to make sure that we could go out on iPad as well by the time we delivered. So that was a little bit of an oversight, but look, best laid plans, you know, it's just moving so fast, you're going to have things like that come up. Um, and I'm sure Kate will talk more about this, but financing and contracting, MEAA I still find haven't really caught up in terms of, you know, getting to actors early, making sure that they know things are in there and how you do that. Um, is is really important as well. Just so you just saves you time down the track. Um, so nearly done. The outcome the outcome has been fantastic. We're really thrilled with the, the project on lots of levels. There's some quotes there from kids. A lot of the we found a lot of the kids were really um, into you uh, like they were using the words episode and game in the same kind of sentence. They were one for them. They weren't feeling that there were episodes and then there were games. They were feeling that it was the one thing and that was a real marker of success to us because that's how we wanted the project to, to come across. We've had over 400,000 players to date and that's still growing. Um, it's been the top game at the ABC for over five months um, and we're getting international sales and starting to get some award nominations, which is really nice. Um, we've just had it, we've sold it to CBBC and they'll be rolling it out um, later this year um, as intended and, and they were really excited about the project. They felt it was something that they just, on a global market, they weren't seeing projects like this. So it was lovely to be able to get that affirmation that we were, you know, doing something in little old Australia that, you know, was really, um, really exciting for them on a global level. So that's the basis of it. Thanks for all that detail, Julia. That's brilliant. <laughs> and Kate, where would you like to? You want to stay sat there and? Uh, yep. Okay. Yep, yep. And just bark orders to shift your. <laughs> oh, actually, no. I might stand up as well. Okay. Yeah, and I'll just click with this. Um, so, as I'm sure you all know, a lawyer's job is exceptionally exciting. Um, so, what I thought I'd do is work uh, through a full financing agreement, clause by clause. Um, actually, no, that's not what I'm going to do. Um, but what I am going to do is, is give you some really... Uh, that's not working, actually. Do I? Oh, no, it's me. Um, give you sort of three things that you really um, kind of need to know from a lawyer's point of view and um, when, you're do when you're doing these projects. So when you're doing what we would call co cross-platform or multimedia or going from one genre to another or one platform to another... Um, th these rules, I think, really apply. So make sure you have the rights. You've probably heard that a few times and I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit more in a second about what that means. Be very clear about who gets what and protect the IP, um, that's the intellectual property, the copyright, the trademarks, um, as you unravel its elements. So cross-platforming as an afterthought is an expensive process. Um, you need to do it, as, as Julie and as Nathan have said, you've got to do it straight away if you really want to. Um, it, it, you've got to be serious from the outset. You've got to know what you're doing from the outset. And from, from a legal point of view, you've got to get the rights. Um, so that means in your initial chain of title documents, um, that is your option and purchase agreement with your riders, your licence agreements, your riders agreements, etc. you need to have the full suite of legal rights to do 
all the beautiful things that you've seen the guys have done in their projects. Um, you can renegotiate at a later date to do those things, but um, the people that are giving you the rights, uh, you, you've lost your bargaining power, so you, they're gonna have you over the barrel, it's gonna be more expensive. Um, now, when I say get rights, I don't just mean from your kind of key creators, you've really got to take it right through your production, and this, play, this applies both to games um, as well as to your TV people, your film people, so your creators, your writers, your directors, you should all know that. But you also need to get your illustrators and your other visual artists on board with your cross-platform rights. You need to get your music and your sound effects. You need to get your actors, your voice actors, personalities, if you're going to use individual personalities. Um, if it's a documentary-based project, you're going to need to make sure that they agree for you to multi-platform um, their personality. Logos, names, slogans, things like noises that might be really critical to, a, a, like, for example, a game, the the splishy, splashy sound of um, sliced fruit for Fruit Ninja obviously is a really important part of that game. So, you know, that's a, that's a sound effect. Uh, locations for using well-known buildings. So really need to kind of go right down, drill right down, and et cetera. So pretty much everything you're doing, you know, you get a precedent document that includes cross-platforming and what you're gonna do. Um, be clear about who gets what. Um, and, and this is all about an ongoing conversation. Um, when you're working with, particularly when you're working with an existing media brand, um, such as Fr Fruit Ninja, for example, that Sam's gonna talk about, you really need to be clear how, I presume, sorry, I presume that Sam's gonna be talking about, you really need to be clear about how that work, for example, the television series, is going to relate legally and commercially to the new project that you're creating or the new brand that you're creating. Um, who's gonna own the intellectual property in that derivative work? Um, what's the scope of your permission if you are making the derivative work. If you're producing a TV series, for example, based on the game, can you make spin-offs or sequels? Um, can you make other derivative works? What are your restrictions? Can you make an interactive website or is that too close to the original game? Um, who gets final creative and commercial say on the derivative project? So Julie sort of touched on that in terms of having showrunners. I mean, who, who is maintaining the vision of, of these projects as they go cross-platform and how are you making sure that that's consistent? Um, who will collect the money and what can be deducted of that money before it goes back to your investors? Um, who's permitted to do the merchandising? Um, will the television merchandising be different from the games merchandising and at what point in time are you both competing for the same, uh, the same dollar in the, sh in the shop? How do you make sure you don't compete against each other in the marketplace? Um, who's responsible for the costs? Who's responsible if you get sued? Don't say Kate. Um, <laughs> fully negotiated agreements are important here um, and everyone must be clear. So the clearer you are in these issues right at the outset, the smoother that those relationships are going to go and, and the more money you're going to make. And then the last thing is protect the IP as you unravel it. This is a really technical kind of legal thing. Um, but copyright gets grey when you start to sti um, stitch it. So if you're ba ba and break a project down into a constituent element. So, you know, there are certain elements that you need to use, as I said before, like the splashy noise in Fruit Ninja, um, that are really critical for a project, but the law might not see them as being something that's um, subject to copyright, by the way, that that is protected in copyright, just in case anyone wants to use that noise. Um, but there is no copyright in an idea. It's the only the expression of that idea is protected. So as you unstitch a project or an idea or a concept, you really need to use other ways to protect and to transact with that. Um, use commercial methods and contractual methods to preserve it and its elements. And they are delicate elements. It becomes very important to stop other people from, from nicking them or using them in the marketplace. It'll actually dilute their value. Um, and, so you, and, you, and if that happens, you won't be able to necessarily rely on the courts to try and help you out. So you've got to use confidentiality, you've got to use your contracts, you've got to really guard um, and have a team that's really going to guard your project for you. So that's my tips. That's awesome. I, um, Kate just gave you, and Julie's probably going to agree, the biggest shortcuts in how to get to what we've done around based on those. Mm, so if you're going to share those, that would be good <laughs> with everyone. But like, I think when I watch all of those, I go, oh, I remember that project where we didn't get clearance on a building for we got a clearance we got clearance because your crew don't understand the multi-platform world either. Mm. So when you make a web series, if we didn't get the same, if our clearance on a location didn't actually cover off other media, we weren't there. I mean, I remember there was a 
photo, we got clearance on a TV show and for a photo in the background that co ended up costing us fifteen thousand dollars for the because it was in the online piece. Luckily, it was for an American client, so they could afford it. But but that's one of them. It was very good. So. Okay. Do you want to Is this working? It? Yes. Yeah, I'm, I might stand up because I'm fooling you. Well, no offense. <laughs> it's late <laughs> afternoon and I had an early morning up. So, so thanks, Kate. That was great. Um, <laughs> thank you. That was really badly She's done put. Full content, <laughs> All right. Hi, everyone. I'll stand here. Um, so, yeah, I'm the CEO of the People's Republic Ani of Animation. My name's Sam White. Um, just in case you have heard of us before, we were acquired, the company was acquired by Halfbrick last year. Um, which really changed things a lot for us. Uh, we were a production company, a work for hire animation studio. Pretty much before that, we did short films and stuff, but we had to give that up a few years ago because it, it was impossible to make a business out of it. Um, so yeah, this is what we do now. We, we really are taking the fun that we find in Half Brick Games and taking that out to a wider audience through entertainment content. Um, it's a bit of a, probably a more of a commercial, or commercially driven um, idea, I guess, or, or a project, a company so you know we're obviously working with existing brands like Fruit Ninja I see um, and um, and Jetpack Joyride and so it's been really interesting coming on and, and seeing the difference that it makes to work with a brand that's already huge um, but it also has some challenges uh, where do I point this okay so Fruit Ninja we all know that um, so we came onto the onto Fruit Ninja as a, as a project to develop a TV series uh, that was about two years ago and then the company was acquired last year, like I said, so we could devote more fully to that. Um, but it, it, we're still in development, so I can't really show you anything that's been finished. Um, it's a, it can be a long process, as you all know, developing a TV series. And as you all know, Fruit Ninja ca came inbuilt with one character, this old dude here called Sensei. He's a great design and everything, but it's a pretty hard character to, to sell, especially to kids, and that, that's really the audience we were going for. Um, and I just did somehow go through a whole bunch of, did I do that? Yeah. Oh, okay, can you go back one? Yeah, so we did, we've done a couple of trailers uh, to promote the game, you know, and that sort of helped us develop a bit of a world, a bit of a style. Um, but all the while we had to develop a story, we had to come up with a story from scratch and we're still doing that. Like we literally just had a call today with a, ride, a writing team from uh, America who, it, you know, it's taken us this long to find the team that we think is right for the project. Um, so pretty fussy about that as well. Um, these are some of the characters that we've developed so far. This, this, you're probably like the first pe people to see these outside of the company. They may not look like this um, when we actually get to the show. Uh, and when I say show, it could be a web series, it could be anything. We're not looking at just TV. Um, and I can talk a bit more about that later, but we'll talk about it now. Um, yeah, I mean, we're really looking at a web series as the first way to take this out to the fans and it's working perfectly because we've got people like YouTube and you know ready to to get behind it um, YouTube if you don't know are really pushing into kids and family and try to build trying to build that channel as a kids and family destination um, and they are willing to work with people with existing IP like Fruit Ninja or existing YouTube channels which have a lot of traction already um, so worth talking to um, and Oh, can you go back one more? Sorry, I haven't finished yet, sorry. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, so we're, it'll probably, you know, most likely come out on a web series because it much as, as the same as we develop games, it's a very iterative, iterative process in games and we're sort of mimicking that in a way. Um, you know, we can, we can test things. We, we come in built with uh, millions of, you know, what, 30 million monthly users, right? So we can test things. Uh, we can try a webisode or two and see what the reaction's like and get feedback from the audience. Um, and, you know, that's one of the things that many producers can't do, so we have to make the most of that. Um, so, yeah, that's where we are with Fruit Ninja. It's, it's been a very challenging, uh, or interesting path. You know, it's taken a couple of years to get to the point where we're, where we're ready. Um, so, but I'm ha happy to take more questions about that one. And just a quick look at what we're doing for Jetpack Joyride, and I think Jason from Half Brick came in this morning and played a video that we produced, so I'm not going to play it again. Um, but we are developing this guy, Barry Steak Fries, who is the, the hero from Jetpack Joyride, and Age of Zombies, and Monster Dash. Um, he's really the IP behind all these games. So he's this character IP that we're, going, we're looking to develop into its own series. Um, he's a, it's an older skew, whereas Fruit Ninja, we're going for like a sort of 6 to a 12 demo. Uh, Barry Steak Fries, you know, he's a little bit edgier, probably 9 to 14. 
you know, he's a bit of a washed-up action hero, and um, you know, he's sort of he doesn't swear anymore and he doesn't smoke anymore, but it, it's a little bit on the edgier side, and we can have a bit more fun with that there. But nine to fourteen is getting into a better range for web as well. So uh, at the moment, we're working with uh, Machinima, and we've actually got a, a, a clip coming out today. The one that Jason showed you today, that's coming out today, I believe. If you download Jetpack Joyride, the update now, I think it's come out today. Um, you can see how we've used this clip in the game. And what we've done, uh, which you saw this morning, we've done a, a really short series. It's literally just what, probably three short comedy, uh, com comedic um, rock opera music videos, right? And we've had a couple of the guys from the band called The Beards uh, write some sort of funny songs. And it's literally just Barry singing an opera about various mundane things in his life, but it's kind of funny. Um, and um, so we're going to do two or three of those uh, with Machinima, uh, who are obviously the big, uh, massive games-themed YouTube channel. So that'll help drive viewers back to our channel, and it's a bit of a partnership, a bit of an experiment <coughs> to see how many viewers we can both bring to the table there. Um, and yeah, so after that, what, we w what the plan is is that we can take that, you know, we can show the traction that we've had, we can show that we've had millions of views, you know, Machinima can get behind it with their, you know, 20-person sales team, and we can take in a, a pitch for, a, say, a web series, for a more narrative-based web series to a brand sponsor, all right? So picture a brand like, you know, Lynx, where it's that kind of sort of parody, manly, macho brand, you know, who's kind of happy to take the piss out of themselves. Um, you know, could come on, sponsor these this websites, and effectively pay for the production. Um, they get association with the brand and all the promotion and you know distribution via mobile, which is extremely valuable to them. Um, and Machinima get content on their channel, um, and we obviously get to build our characters and and our brand and and keep exploiting that. Um, so this is what happens when you when you load up the game when you download it today, which I'm sure you all will. It's free if you haven't got it already. Um, uh, so yeah, basically we've shown, we put the, the rock opera uh, into the game. So you go into the menu, which was just the previous screen, to buy suits, right? If you play Jetpack Joyride, you can deck Barry out in different suits. Um, you watch, it's an incentivized view. So what we do is say, watch this video and you get a free costume for Barry, right? So we're immediately giving a, the players a reason to watch this video um, and rewarding them for it. So. That's going to be really interesting to see how many views that drives, and I'm sure it'll be pretty successful from what we've seen. Uh, so the player gets something for watching it, that'll spread, and all those views, it's a YouTube embed, so all those views accumulate on, on our YouTube channel, um, or the YouTube channel that we're hosting on with Machinima. Um, and then, yeah, so this is what happens. You see the clip in the game, you finish it, you close it, you get your suit, and you get back into the game. So that's how we're integrating shorts into the game. Yeah, what's next? Uh, and yeah, again, I was just going to talk about the deal that well, the sort of that the test that we're doing with Machinima, um, and that's what's been great about these brands, I guess. Jetpack Joyride, Fruit Ninja, it's opened every single door. Uh, really, we've got meetings with everyone we need uh, in the network side, on the platforms, you know, the Netflix, the Hulu's, the YouTube's, Amazon's, everyone. But it doesn't close the deal for us. Like we still need to develop a really hot idea, and you know, it's. We're, we're just under as much uh, criticism, I guess, and scrutiny as any other producer who comes in the door. So, y y and, and even more so, more so than some of these guys, because a lot of the networks, you say, you walk in, oh yeah, we got 500 million downloads or whatever. It, it just doesn't mean anything to them anymore. Everyone says it now. You know, every second day in the kids' space, there's a new show that's being, you know, built off an app. You know, Moshi Monsters, uh, Subway Surfers, uh, Tom, that Talking Tom, every day. So we've really got to make sure that show is strong on its own. Um, especially with Fruit Ninja, so we're taking our time, doing it properly, and ideally, you know, 25 years down the track, like with Ninja Turtles, we've got to show that kids are still watching and still relevant. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit about what I'll, what we're doing. Or should I stop now? Maybe uh, we've yeah. we'll just have enough time for some questions if you do. Cool. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> Thank you, sir. That's good. Let's, okay. let's just go straight to questions. I think we've got about five or six minutes. Ten minutes still, great. Come on, let's finish the day with a bang. Have you got any questions? Yeah, but uh, <laughs> look, if we only have... <laughs> just yep, one over there. Thanks. Uh, just recapping on that, um, on the 
the sleeves video that you're doing, partnering with Mishimina on on YouTube. So is there a revenue sharing between that partnership? Is that or or uh, or, or, or they paying for that production of that video? What's no. the uh, what's the story behind that? Yeah, so this one it's a very it's a very experimental, and I guess we're lucky in a way that we um, you know since the acquisition we've got a small you know a modest budget that we can we can try on testing little things, right? And so that's part of what we're doing. You know, we're just dropping a little bit of money into a few things, testing them, see how they go, and go from there. Machinima aren't haven't contributed financially to this one, and we're not running ads on it um, just at the moment. We may in future but it's really the whole idea for it was to see how many views we could drive working with a an MCN you know multi-channel network like Machinima as opposed to just running it on our own channel so you've paid them for no, some support? It, it's, no it's it's re- literally a, a handshake um, because they see a lot of value in working with us because we can we can reach you know uh, what ten, tens of millions of players on mobile and bring them back to the Machinima channel so they benefit as well um, and it's a core audience for them, you know, it's a game. I mean, Machinima was a bit more of a core demo, so sort of hardcore games, but they're stru- sort of trying to bring in some of that mobile audience, I guess, and the casual gamer audience. Thank you. It's uh, very clear that you're using these platforms to bring an audience to the television program. Um, uh, have there been any demonstrable, clear-cut cases where the o- the audience numbers in the ratings have been substantially increased by having a website program? Because some programs have websites, some do not. Are the ones with websites bigger in the ratings? Is that for, for me or any, anyone? Anyone? Yeah. Well, well, I mean, it's hard to prove, I guess, because if you, if you go out with it, then you don't know what it's like to not go out with it. But one of the most interesting things that I found at Matchbox is um, when, we were look, when we were looking at the straights, and we actually, um, through, it wasn't a website, but through engaging people online more effectively, we actually turned our ratings that were dropping round again. So that was a very clear correlation between the amount of online engagement we saw and, and when we extended our reach through simple things like Facebook advertising, we actually saw the numbers turn. So that's a personal example I can give. But if you go out altogether, it's hard to say, Nathan. Mm. Um, this, is the, this is the weird world of measurement in this, in this sort of space is that uh, there's no easy answer to that. And anecdotally, we can say we can see that there are spikes in uh, the ratings, or we can see that the numbers in the online have sort of sort of followed through with what goes on air. But to be honest, um, I've got weir- the weirdest uh, stats around some of the stuff we've done. Dance Academy, for example, once we take in this, the traditional stats that we've got uh, based against the numbers of the show, um, in season two, we got 140% conversion. So. That doesn't actually make sense, <laughs> only that there were people who were then actually engaging with the online components that maybe ha- weren't being reflected in the ratings. Um, there's, I think, you know, so I think just that it was one of Mike's questions here, I wrote them down. Secrets and Lies was 48% conversion um, online. One of the other measures, too, is the amount of time people spend on on. Yeah the multi-platform too. So one of our most successful was Emmerdale, which was the one that everybody didn't think was going to work because it was um, basically what they would class as old people. Um, and it was 20 minutes. Um, aver- you know, each user that we had was about 20 minutes per person. Um, yeah, Dance Academy was 140. Uh, slide was 57%. So I can't do... I can't promise you that this is going to drive people to your site. I think what will promise you that is actually, one, that you've got the support and marketing from the network. Two, you've actually given them compelling content that's engaged them there and then they want to see what happens when you put that on telly as well. So, Another question? Yep. I think that's, that's it for today. So thank you, Mike, and everybody for a great presentation. Thank you.